Good morning. We are here. I'm thankful that you have carved out this hour, not even quite an hour, to join together and to worship our God and learn to live like Christ and remind ourselves again of the Holy Spirit's power that can change us and lead us to our forever home. I greet you today with these words from Jesus as recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Come and fill yourself with worship and God's grace. Our call to worship this morning is this, and it's fashioned after the Gospel reading. Hungering and thirsting, we come to the Lord. Jesus is the living bread. Feed us with your love and healing power, O Lord. Give us the bread of hope and compassion that we may also feed others. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your compassion for us. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your steadfast love. Amen. Last week we talked a bit about our calling, and all of us are called. Today we'll hear how Paul is calling all of us to be more like Jesus, who is calling us to follow him. Jesus calls us our first hymn. now this opening prayer which comes from Psalm 130. Out of the depths we cry to you, O God. Let your ears be attentive to our voices as we call. If you, O God, should mark sins, we would be lost. But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be glorified. You, God, our steadfast love and powerful redemption. Teach us to be Christ-like. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 18, verses 5 through 9, verse 15, and verses 31 through 33. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David, and there was there a great slaughter that day of twenty thousand men. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And ten young men that bare Joab's armor compassed about, and smote Absalom, and slew him. And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. 
And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate, and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Our gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 35 and 41 through 51. Jesus said, I am the bread that gives life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who has faith in me will ever be thirsty. The people started grumbling because Jesus had said he was the bread that had come down from heaven. They were asking each other, Isn't he Jesus, the son of Joseph? Don't we know his mother and father? How can he say that he's come down from heaven? Jesus told them, Stop grumbling. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me makes them want to come. But if they do come, I will raise them to life on the last day. One of the prophets wrote, God will teach all of them. And so everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him will come to me. The only one who has seen the Father is the one who has come from him. No one else has ever seen the Father. I tell you for certain that everyone who has faith in me has eternal life. I am the bread that gives life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, and later they died. But the bread from heaven has come down so that no one who eats it will ever die. I am that bread from heaven. Everyone who eats it will live forever. My flesh is the life-giving bread that I give to the people of this world. Good morning. Another meat and potatoes day for us from Paul. Lists of do's and don'ts are helpful if we choose to follow them. I found a lot of lists to share with you, so before I share Paul's list, here's another. I think this list should be titled, To-Do List to Make People Sit Up and Take Notice. Of course, some of us don't want to be noticed. I'm thinking that may be any one of us as we read through these verses from Paul's letter, because sadly, we will surely notice ourselves in some of these do's and don'ts. Paul is a good writer. He uses different techniques to organize his work to make it more understandable. For this one, he sort of plays off previous verses, parts of 22 and 24. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. Paul says, because you are a new creation in Christ, and he's talking to the Gentiles here, but always to us as well, we want to no longer be like our old selves and be a new self. We get that. We think that from time to time. We tell ourselves we aren't going to do this or that anymore. We aren't going to say these words, eat this bad for us thing, lose our temper, delay doing what needs to be done. We want to put off our old selves and put on the new self that new self being what Christ would do. So using the format of put off and put on, let's look at verses chapter 4, 26 through chapter 5, 2, beginning with 26 and 27. Be angry without sinning. Don't let the sun set on your anger. Don't provide an opportunity for the devil. For this, let's put off getting angry. Paul doesn't say what to put on per se, but he's clear about anger. Getting angry and staying that way opens the door for the devil to come in. The devil then will tell us all the reasons our anger is justified, that our displeasure with someone is all about them and has nothing to do with us. I would argue that in most cases, anger is usually a two-way street. We feel unheard, unappreciated, unloved. At the same time, the other person is feeling the very same way. And when we begin with an angry face, angry words follow, and hurt feelings are right on the tail end of that. Put off getting angry, and maybe we should put on the shoes and the glasses of the other person and see what they see. Walk where they are walking. Mark Roberts reminds us that sometimes anger is justified. I think about the fact that Jesus was angry over the money changers in the temple. God was angry over the Israelites worshiping the golden calf. But here's the harder part. Get angry without hurting people and without sinning. We can work on that. Next part. 
Thieves should no longer steal. Instead, they should go to work using their hands to do good so that they will have something to share with whoever is in need. I've never shoplifted. We don't do our own taxes, so we don't cheat there. I don't think she does either. I've lusted after some people's pumpkins on their front porch, but I've not taken them. Once, Rayanne, when she was five or six, put a keychain in the shopping cart at Jamesway. I had thrown my coat on top of it and didn't notice it until we got to the car. I dashed into the store to pay for it, and I was sure the police would come after me before I got back inside. But Paul says, don't steal. Put off taking what isn't ours and put on good, honest work. There's a reason to do that, and that's probably more important than the advice to not steal. It's so that with the money we have from our good, honest work done now or done before, that money can be used to do good. The new we put on is a giving spirit, joyfully shared from our work. Next part. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Say only what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. Don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. You drop a raw egg on the floor. You stub your toe. Your computer glitch makes work impossible. Been there, done that, right? And sometimes the words pop out. Sometimes a bad word makes us feel cleansed a bit. A moment of release. Maybe foul words are a habit, but that's the old self. Paul says, put off bad talk, the kind you shouldn't have said in front of your grandmother, and put on words that are more appropriate. Our language today is full of words that my mother wouldn't have wanted me to say, so that's Paul's advice. Put off unwholesome talk. Put on words that build up others instead. You know what those things are. We all do. Proverbs 25:11 says, "A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver." Ever read reviews online? Recently, I was talking about those things. Some people always give reviews, and some people only give bad reviews. I maintain this and have since I became a teacher. It's easy to find something wrong with anything. Probably a restaurant already knows that the salad wasn't as crisp as it usually is. Probably the kid whose kick hit the goalpost knows it was three inches in the wrong way. Probably the husband knows he missed a spot on the right side of the car when he washed it. But we need to turn it all around. Put on language that builds up and say those things, those kinds of things. Thanks and affirmation make the Holy Spirit happy. And Christ-like language comes from our hearts. That's where our language should come from. Next, put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, and slander, along with every other evil. Be kind and compassionate and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. It's clear in these two verses, put, on all, put off all kinds of bitterness, rage, fighting, gossip, add to that every other evil. Well, that sort of includes anything that Christ wouldn't do. Every other evil, including these things and lying, angry words, stealing, foul language. Of course, there's a whole lot of other evil in the world. Put off that and put on kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Oh man, how hard is all of that? Kindness and compassion is easy for people we love and who show us the same thing. That's easy, but we don't always do unto others what we want others to do unto us. We sometimes get that wrong. We wait for them to be kind first, and then we are kind in return. We wait for them to show love and care, then they will get theirs. When I was a principal, I used to remind students all the time that adults get respected. I don't know how many times I was reminded by the kids that teacher needs to respect me first. Truly, mutual respect is a lovely and biblical thing. But if it's not in place, it has to start someplace, right? Put off all unchristlike behavior. Put on the golden rule. And now the conclusion. All of the previous verses summed up in this section. Therefore, imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love, following the example of Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. He was a sacrificial offering that smelled sweet to God. Well, that's very clear. If we act like Christ, we will be doing life right. If we follow his examples, we, will be, we are going to come very close to what Paul asks us to put on. Put on Christ. 
If we do our best at feeding the hungry, visiting the poor and lonely, serving others, looking for the lost and helping them get found, praying often, seeking time with God, loving others, staying hooked to the Father, not judging, but reminding them to follow more closely like he did with the Samaritan woman, go and sin no more, he said. And if we work at leading others to accept God's love in their life, we will be like putting on Christ. We need to do that because, after all, Christ gave his life for us, so we ought to at least give our every effort to do what he did, say what he said, love like he did, walk in his way. That walk thing is not a new way for Paul to emphasize something. Like a good writer, he repeats to be sure the message gets home. Paul wrote about walking with God already in Ephesians 2.10. It says it this way, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then last week we were reminded of this. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Walk. A slow process. We need to commit to walk with God in Christ's footsteps daily, step by step. So what do we do? This week, the to-dos are right in front of us, but we can't build Rome in a day. We can't do everything all at once. But choose for yourself one thing that is on the list to put off. Will you put off foul language or anger? Will you put on serving another in love or building someone up? Will you put off slander or bitterness, that, which might be like holding a grudge? Will you put on kindness and the epitome of the golden rule? We can't turn perfect overnight, but we can commit to putting off one unchrist-like thing and work harder to putting on Christ in that category. It's our job to be imitators. This video will remind us of that. <laughs> video didn't help you commit yourself to doing one thing better, putting on one more thing, maybe this video will. Sing along. More like you, Jesus, more like you. Fill my heart with your Like you.
pray with me. Lord, we confess that we want the easy way out. When things go wrong, we want to find someone else to blame. When we don't get what we want, we want to pout and whine. We don't want to look at the ways in which we have done the things Paul's us, Paul tells us to stop doing. We have even stopped listening to you. But now we come to you asking for forgiveness and healing. Our hearts and lives are empty without your love. Our spirits wither and die in this wasteland when you are not front and center for us. Help us to truly worship you and to willingly work for healing and hope in this world. Lord, we come to you this day with so many things going on in our lives. Some of these things are wonderful and cause us to rejoice. However, despite the joys in our lives, there are far too many things that cause us fear and anxiety. We know people who are lost and lonely. There are people who are grieving and sick. 
Lord, we lift these concerns to you now, knowing that you hear our prayers for ourselves and our family and friends and our world. Holy and living one, for those we've named and the ones whose names we do not know, hear our prayers. There is never a time when we must hide from you. There's never a time that you are not waiting for us to speak to you. Speak, Lord, and lead us to live a life that honors you. We ask all of this in Christ's name, and we pray now the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Paul tells us to walk with the Master. This song tells us the very same thing. You can sing along. this benediction. We have worshipped you, Lord. We have heard Paul's words on how to put on Christ. As we leave this time of worship, help us put off things that grieve you and the Holy Spirit, and let us live in the ways that honor you. Guide our lives, Lord. Amen.